Hello, I'm Dr. Jim Crowley, and this talk is based on a portion of the information found in the chapter called The Health Benefits of a God-Centered Paradigm of the book I recently published titled Believing is Seeing, Focus Through a God-Centered Paradigm. So the title is, What if Moses had a freezer and a microwave? Would anything have been different? Moses' laws did not focus on treating diseases in the Old Testament, but focused on preventing diseases and promoting health. Medical historian Ralph Major described Moses as the greatest sanitary engineer the world has ever seen. Moses, or, or really God, believes in the principle that prevention of disease is much simpler and invariably more far-reaching than the cure of disease. Approximately one half of all cancers are found in the digestive tract and the organs associated with digestion. Paul Bragg in his cookbook stated the average person is poisoning himself day by day with the food he eats. Nearly 50% of Americans are overweight. Nearly 30 million people in the United States have diabetes, 25% of adults over age 65 have diabetes. The rate of newly diagnosed people with diabetes has tripled in the last 30 years. A recent study found that there were nearly 100 million Americans that are pre-diabetic or diabetic, and approximately half of those are unaware of it. So, the health laws of Moses in the Old Testament. What are the health laws? Are they scientifically based and do they still apply today? So we're gonna go over some of that. So if you look at the word death and you take the first and last letter off, what do you get? Eat. Does God really care about what you eat and your health? Third John chapter one, verse two says, Dear friend, I pray that you are in good health and that may all go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. In Exodus 23, verse 25, you must serve only the Lord your God. If you do, I will bless you with food and water, and I will protect you from illness. As the Israelites were leaving Egypt, there were nearly three million Israelites at that time. And you had old people, young people, sick people, crippled people, but not one single person Israelite was left behind. They were all healed of their disease so that they could walk out of there and go towards the promised land. He took care of them. The only requirement was that they were to worship only him. But unfortunately, if you read through the Bible, they were never able to, able to do that. They suffered illnesses and diseases like everyone else. But God's intention was that they were to be healthier than anyone else. So 1 Corinthians says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So it appears God wants us to be healthy. God wants his people to be different than the rest of the people in the world. We are supposed to be examples to others. We need to be happy, healthy, so that others wouldn't want to be like us. We are a reflection of Christ. He loves us and wants what is best for us. So what we eat and drink should be to the glory of God and we should be following his guidelines for life. Another verse, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself anymore for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. The Seventh-day Adventists take these verses very seriously and are very health conscious. And you will see in a book that they live longer than any American group of people in the United States. The Holy Spirit lives inside of all Christians and I'm gonna provide information on where I think the Holy Spirit communicates with you and resides in you in the book. So let's take a look at some of the things about some of the laws that Moses wrote, which can be found in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And we're not gonna cover all of these, but we're gonna go through most of the ones about diet and food. So you see this nice lady with these beautiful teeth. 
So do you think this person could go out the back door of their hut and go out and go to the water buffalo their husband just shot and take a big chunk out of that water buffalo with these teeth? Not possible. We, we, we do not have teeth designed to tear and, and, and cut through meat. We are, we're designed according to our teeth structure to be like a horse or a cow. We were designed to be vegetarians. So let's take a look and see what the Bible says about that. So in Genesis, God said, look, I have given you every seed bearing plant throughout all the earth and all fruit bearing trees for your food. So you see that Adam and Eve were vegetarians. They did not have to work for it, it was provided for them. But after they sinned and ate of the forbidden fruit, their lives changed. They then became farmers. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from all of it the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food. They're still vegetarians. There's no mention of them eating any meat. So finally a guy got tired of us and said, my spirit will not put up with humans for a, such a long time for they are mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. So we still have physically the capability of living to 120 years. Not very, very few people ever reach that. Back before that time, Adam, Enoch, Noah, all lived to be over 900 years old. So it appears that since man has not been following God's health laws, it appears that our lifespan has been diminishing and now we're limited to 120 years. Man eating meat did not appear in the Bible until Noah. So in Genesis seven, verse two, take with you seven pairs of male and female of each animal I've approved for eating and for sacrifice and take one pair of each of the others. So Noah was the first person that was told that he could eat meat. He was gonna spend essentially a year on the ark. There was no way they were gonna keep vegetables and fruit fresh for that whole year on the ark. So then he allowed them to take animals with them so they would be able to eat while they're on the ark. But he also told them which ones they could eat or not eat. Is that a coincidence maybe that Animals come into the picture about what we eat and our lifespan is starting to diminish? Maybe. So let's look at what the health laws about food say in the Old Testament. So in Leviticus chapter 11, Deuteronomy chapter 14, you find these. So you may eat any land animal that has completely spit, split hooves and chews the cud. You may eat ox, sheep, goat, deer, gazelle, roe deer, wild goat, addicts, antelope, and mountain sheep. You may not eat the camel, hyrax, hare, and pig. So why did God give these instructions about what animals they could eat? Because the animals he forbid them to eat are known to carry diseases. So therefore, he didn't want them to catch any of these diseases, so he told them those animals are off limits. So there was a scientific reason, not just a purely ritual reason or, or biblical reason. Of the marine animals, you may eat anything from the water that has both fins and scales. You may not eat catfish, eels, lobsters, clams, oysters, shrimp, frogs, and others. So why did God separate these animals? Well, you see that all the animals that are, are listed that you're not supposed to eat are scavengers, bottom feeders. And so, therefore, they had a like, more likely chance of having some disease or organism that could, could be uh, fatal to whoever ate them. And so, I mean, I really like lobster, so once a year I still eat one, but uh, our, our health, the, the quality of our food is probably much better than it was in those times. So, you, know, you can get away with it most of the time, but still, you still occasionally hear someone dying or getting very sick from eating raw oysters. It still, it still occurs. The birds... These birds are not to be eaten. The griffin vulture, bearded vulture, black vulture, kite, falcons of all kinds, ravens of all kinds, eagle owl, short-eared owl, seagull, hawks of all kinds, owls, herons, and bats. Now you're starting to see a pattern here. Any animal that is sort of carnivorous in its eating 
has a chance of catching some disease from whatever they are eating and then transmitting that to you. So if some animal has been dead for a while that this scavenger is eating and it's got bacteria or whatever in it, then that animal who's eating that's gonna be contaminated as well. God knew about all the bacteria and viruses that he created uh, and he, he tried to keep those things away from his people. Moses had no idea that the reason for these laws was, was actually health. You must not eat insects that walk on the ground. You must eat winged insects that walk on the ground and have jointed legs so they can jump. These are locusts, bald locusts, crickets, and grasshoppers. So if you're like the guy on TV, Andrew Zimmerman, you can eat these kind of insects if you want to eat them, but, uh, but don't eat the others. Small animals that scurry along the ground, you must not eat. The mole rat, rat, large lizards of all kinds, geckos, monitor lizard, common lizard, sand lizard, and chameleon. Again, these animals carry diseases. They have dangerous bacteria in them like salmonella and other nasty organisms. So you don't want to eat these things. Here's a couple of other laws. You, are not, you must not eat anything that has died from natural causes. Like I just said, if something is dead and you know how it died, you don't know if it died of some disease or what it died from, you do not want to eat that animal. You don't really want to do the roadkill thing. Leviticus 3, verse 17 says, you must never eat fat or blood. This is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed from generation to generation wherever you live. Again, blood contains diseases. And pure fat, and, this, and just pure animal fat, is not healthy to eat. You can see from the health laws in the Bible that God was protecting his people and wanted them to be healthy. There are many other laws in the Bible that are about sanitation, health, and all kinds of other things. And we'll take a look at a couple of them, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on them. So here's uh, some Bible verses about sanitation. All of you have killed anyone or touched a dead body must stay outside the camp for seven days. So in a battle, when they went off to battle... This is the instructions they had. You must purify yourselves and your captives on the third and seventh day, purifying all your clothing to everything made of leather, goat hair, or wood. Anything made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, tin, or lead, that is all metals that do not burn, must be passed through fire in order to be ceremonially pure. These metals must be further purified with the water of purification. But everything that burns must be purified by water alone. On the seventh day, you must wash your clothes and be purified. Then you may return to camp. So when they went off to war, God didn't want them bringing some disease that these other group of people had. When the pilgrims and Europeans came over and settled America, we just the common code devastated the Indian population because they had no immunity against that virus. So he was keeping them healthy. It was a ceremony, but it also was a health thing that they had to purify themselves, clean all their sores. Everything had to be clean before they came home and had to wait seven days so there would be a period of time if they did get sick, they did not bring it back home. Anthony Leeuwenhoek is the father of microbiology and discovered a bacteria in 1676. So it wasn't until 1676 we knew that bacteria even existed. Then Louis Pasteur is famous for his work in bacteria and its relationship diseases in the 1860s. And Robert Koch developed his four postulates for how bacteria causes diseases in the 1880s. And that's still taught in medical school today. Before that time, people had no idea why they were getting sick. Then we have Dmitry Ivanovsk, who first theorized the presence of viruses in 1892. Walter Reed was the first to discover a virus causing disease in humans when he found the cause of yellow fever in 1901. Then came Alexander Fleming and Edward Jenner, who were the first to actually prove that viruses did exist with the invention of the electron microscope. They were the first to actually see viruses under a microscope and that they actually existed. So the health laws and diet laws in the Old Testament do agree with scientific facts about health. These laws did have some religious significance as well, but they also had tremendous health benefits. 
Here you see the first ever health food recipe, and it happens to be in the Bible. So Ezekiel 4, 9 says, Now go and get some wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, and emmer wheat, and mix them together in a storage jar. Use them to make bread for yourself. Ezekiel lived on this alone for one year. So this was God's diet plan for a year for Ezekiel, and this is the first recipe, and it's in the Bible. Now, my great-grandfather lived to be a, nearly 103, and he believed that using honey for a sweetener all of his life was one of the main reasons why he lived that long. He never used any refined sugar. I'm not sure that's really the answer to that, but, that's, but, that's, but it does say the, in the Bible that honey is good. But also it says that don't eat too much of it or it will make you sick. So therefore, this is sort of the first thing about eating in moderation. So here's some other health laws. So there are laws concerning skin disease. There are laws concerning quarantine, about overeating. You have uh, recommending proper rest, positive attitude, the importance of work, not being lazy. And you can see from this small sampling that the Bible is full of guidelines about the health and welfare of God's people. But there are also warnings in the Bible as well. I will lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I will forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. Do you ever notice that families who tend to look the same, that you have a family and all of them are obese in that family? Same thing with like, uh, spousal abuse, people who are abused tend, tend to follow the same pattern, the same family. And in those kind of situations, someone needs to become a hero and change that pattern. Philippians 3, 19, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Man has conveniently rationalized his way into thinking that this world is all about himself and that anything is okay as long as it feels okay, feels good. We are, to focus, we are focused on pleasure and what makes us happy. Let's see what it says about this kind of thing in Isaiah 66, verse 17. Now this is the last chapter of Isaiah and this is referring to the second coming of Christ, not the first coming. Those who concentrate, consecrate and purify themselves in a sacred garden with its idol in the center, feasting on pork and rats and other detestable meats will come to a terrible end. So God is saying that when Jesus returns the second time, he will be judging what we eat and what we're worshiping. Not following his laws and guidelines will lead to a terrible end, it says. So it appears God cares still today in modern times what we eat and, and how we worship. Um, so let's go on to a little bit further. So there are some verses in the New Testament people say, well, those laws don't, the Testament don't matter anymore. And there's some examples of Bible verses they use. But these were speaking specific instances where God didn't want, especially like Peter and Paul, to not be able to go into a Gentile helm to witness to them because of the food that might be served. So I don't think this really does away with the health benefits and stuff that are found in the, in the Old Testament. So would the laws in the Old Testament have been the same if Moses had a freezer and a microwave? Would things would have been different? Because the science of behind the laws in the Old Testament are still scientifically correct. Laws and principles of this world have not really changed over the years. I think they still have value today. So let's take a look at modern times. So let's look at the uh, SARS outbreak. This viral disease originated in China and is believed to have begun in small animals such as the palm civet. The civet is a meat-eating mammal which the civet would, not, would have been on the list not to eat in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 23, 9 through 14 talks about taking that human waste needs to be buried away from a dwelling. 
The Bible is full of health and diet recommendations. If third world countries that are just have horrible health issues follow just the guidelines in the Bible, their lives would be dramatically different. So let's take some, some things at the moment about modern times. So what gets 29 million pounds of antibiotics a year? Who's getting that? Well, actually, the 29 million pounds are going to cattle. So our cattle have fed 29 million pounds of antibiotics a year. 70% of all antibiotics are given to animals. 50% of antibiotics that are given to people are given unnecessarily, and then on top of that, not taken correctly. So you go to the doctor because you feel bad and, you, and, and the doctor wants to be nice to you so that he gives you an antibiotic even though he knows there's probably a viral code you have. And then you start taking that antibiotic and then four or five days later you feel better and so then you stop taking the antibiotic. So now you've not, so you've not completed the full course so now you're exposing bacteria to non-lethal doses of the antibiotic. They're now developing resistance. And the more we prescribe it, antibiotics, the more resistant bacteria becomes. And now that has become a huge problem worldwide about bacteria that are resistant. So let's take a look at some of that. So antibiotic resistant bacteria in a grocery store, 81% of ground turkey has antibiotic resistant bacteria in it. Pork chops, 66% antibiotic resistant bacteria. Ground beef, 55% chicken. 39%. So even in today's modern high-tech society, we still have problems with what's in our food. So let's take a look at some other studies. So the causes for death, numerous different studies have shown different things. 75 to 90% of deaths are related to lifestyle habits of smoking, stress, high blood pressure, overweight, high alcohol consumption, sitting or little, no exercise. These are all our things we put on ourselves. Another study says 50 to 75% or more cancer deaths are related to lifestyle. So the cancers that we get are related to what we do. God didn't create cancer or this disease. Adam and Eve would have never had any of these diseases. We caused this on ourselves because of our rebellion and our failure to follow his laws. And over thousands of years, all these different mutations and things have gotten passed down and passed down because of us, not that God caused them. So there's an order in the list of causes of death that occur in the United States. So the normal cause of death in the United States is tobacco. Second is high blood pressure. Third is alcohol abuse. Fourth is overweight. Low fruit, vegetable intake, physical inactivity, illicit drugs, and unsafe sex. So all, those, all these are related to how Americans are living their lives. Do you know that actually Christians live six to seven years longer than non-Christians? That's not just one study or two studies. It's nearly 2,000 studies have shown that Christians live on an average six to seven years longer. Seventh-day Adventists live nearly 10 years longer because they take seriously about that their body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and they, most of them, are vegetarians and are very much into health. And so they live as long as 10 years longer. There's been hundreds and hundreds of studies done on their lifestyle and their cancer rates, heart attack rates, all those things are dramatically different than the rest of the American population. Mediterranean diet. So the Mediterranean diet has been studied extensively. It's been shown to be basically the best diet plan. There's all kinds of diet plans on the market. This doctor wrote this one. This person wrote that one. This is the way you're supposed to do it. It really, they just are writing a book. The Mediterranean diet has been, is, has been shown over and over to be prop, the best diet that you can go on. Another thing that's interesting is, is that insulin-like growth factor number one. So Dr. Furman, in one of his books, talks about the relationship between the level of insulin-like growth factor one in the body and lifespan. If you're a professional athlete, you want this growth factor to be really high because you're going to be strong and fast. But the higher that level is, the shorter your lifespan is. So... 
it might be great when you're young and you want to be a professional athlete, but long term, that's not good. And this growth factor is increased in your body by eating animal protein. So therefore, if you want to live longer and be healthier, Dr. Furman recommends limiting your animal protein to four ounces or less per day. So how about the Blue Zones? So the book, The Blue Zones, was written by Dan Buettner. He studied five areas in the world where people live over 100 years the most. One of the Blue Zones is in Loma Linda, California, which has a large number of people living there that are Seventh-day Adventists, which we talked about before. And there are several characteristics that all these, comp these five areas have. So if you want to live to be over 100, but your best chance at it, this is the nine things you can follow. That is moderate, regular physical activity, having a life purpose, low stress, moderate calorie intake, Mediterranean-like diet, engagement in spiritual or spirituality or religion, engagement in family life, engagement in social life, moderate alcohol in intake, especially wine. So, if you buy a machine, that machine, the manufacturer of that machine gives you a set of instructions or a manual how to operate that machine. We are God's creation. God manufactured us and he has given us an instruction manual, the Bible. So we should plan or we should follow his instructions and guidelines that are in the Bible because he is our manufacturer. And we should follow his diet plan. So the Mediterranean diet includes fruits, nuts, seeds, vegetables, beans, legumes, and which is very much the Bible and, and that is pretty much the same. The Mediterranean diet and what's described in the Bible is similar. I think that you should eat one meal, should be a large salad for the day. And then according to Dr. Furman and what we saw before, we should limit our animal protein to four or five ounces a day. And it should be lean meat or maybe oily fish like salmon uh, if you want to extend your life and live happier and healthier. Isaiah 55 verses one through two says, invitation to God's, to the Lord's salvation. Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me, and you eat what is good. You enjoy the finest food. You can look at these verses a couple of different ways. Here's a couple of points. This invitation is spiritual, and it's also about your health. Salvation is free, and eternal Benefits of that are awesome. Living life according to God's will means you eat the correct foods and live a long and happy life. Again, this talk is based on a portion of the chapter in the book titled, The Health Benefits of a God-Centered Paradigm. Again, we have a website, believeinascene.org. All proceeds are being donated to missions coordinated by Vision Outreach International. There's a place to leave comments. You can purchase the book on the website. Uh, if you um, per prefer to purchase it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, Books a Million is available there. If you, really, if you really like the book, please go to those websites and not write a nice review. You can always email me at drcrowley at floridacataract.com. And um, I hope you will consider reading this book and, and, and I think it has a lot of things in there that you may not be aware of that can change your life. And I pray that it will be a blessing in your life you, and you can support missions at the same time by purchasing this book. And it's really true what the title says, Believing is Seen. May God bless you with healthy eyes, great vision, and may you always focus through a God-centered paradigm. Have a great day in the Lord.